So uh, as many of you are familiar with, we're starting this um, brain computer interfaces uh, effort inside Microsoft Research. There's a cross collaboration across a couple of teams here. And uh, in uh, looking at the related work, we came across uh, Natalia Kosmina's uh, recent journal paper. That was a great overview mm -hmm. for the various efforts in this space. Um, yeah, you did your PhD in Grenoble on BCI. Yes. And then a postdoc in VR, AR, and Yeah, Korea. it in RIA. And now yeah. you're a postdoc with Patty Mace. Yes. And you have a couple of overview slides on what the group's doing for those yeah. people that don't know the uh, Patty's group in Media Lab. So yeah. looking forward to seeing that. And then afterwards, we have. Um, like a round table discussion for mm -hmm. people that want to stay, but totally understand if you want to people. Mm -hmm. so. right, Great. Welcome. Thank you so much for this uh, warm welcome. So first, as Christian said, uh, he actually asked me to do some kind of internal, very fast overview about the group, so you will have a quick grasp what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and then I will actually move to BCI. So, uh, yeah, my name is not Patty Mayes, but uh, she's a principal investigator at MIT uh, Media Lab. And our group is called Fluid Interfaces. It has nothing to do with physics, <laughs> with fluids. It's about technology. So, uh, we have a growing number of devices on us, and they're getting with each month closer and closer to our bodies. But they take our attention, our memory, our cognitive resources, and we just start to understand what effect they're actually making on us. And the interest of the group is, can we create systems that can sense a user's internal and external state and intervene to seamlessly enhance our cognitive abilities? What I mean by that is that right now, if I take my phone, which is obviously a very, very useful device, um, it makes my life easier. I don't need to remember a lot of things, but I'm spending my life like this. And can we do something with it? Because we're still going to have those, and we have, we'll have more of those, actually. But can we somehow help the user to be on task on hand, to be with others, and not be dividing his or her attention, memory, etc.? cetera? Uh, there's really uh, more than 20 projects going, going in the group, and we are focusing on decisions, attention, well-being, memory, dreams, and learning. I'm not going to go through all of them because that's not the focus of the group, but I'm going to show you a couple of ones. So first, one of the projects for decision making, and this is a project that is called Alter Ego. And this is a project of um, now a PhD student, Arnav Kapoor, and here I'm going to show you a video. So it's a variable system. Uh, that allows using EMG uh, muscle activity to pick up um, the suffocalization of the words. So he, as you can see, he's not pronouncing any single word, but he is suffocalizing them. And this can let the system pick it up and through the bone conduction provide him with the feedback in real time. Is this a drop microphone or just electrode for EMG? There is two electrodes. There is also a bone conduction microphone. And obviously, a Bluetooth to be connected to the internet. So this is one of the projects. This is actually a very good example of what we are doing in the team. And with my projects on BCI, you're going to see it. The systems are variable. They are seamless. Obviously, you can see it on the user. But now we have our actually a version that is uh, much less visible. They don't require any external device to function. Uh, and they're non-invasive. This is another example. This is a project called BioEssence. So it's an open source olfactory display that monitors cardiorespiratory information to support mental well-being. So uh, the device can be worn in different form factors. We have, once again, even smaller ones right now. And um, once again, it doesn't require uh, its wireless. And it can release different types of smell. Why doing so? Because a lot of research uh, points out that when uh, we smell coffee or peppermint, uh, we are getting like more awake, we are getting more attention. If like right now I would spread some ilang ilang, for example, or peppermint, you would pay more attention to me. Hopefully you still do. <laughs> I'm gonna show you some other keys how to do that. 
as this is an example of actually how the system works as a hardware and in the software user can control all the components, the time of the release uh, of the smell, etc. Finally, this is going to be presented uh, at CHI in uh, one month from now in Glasgow. So this is uh, another variable system. So uh, as you can see, all of the projects are variable devices. It's a variable vestibular stimulation device that stim stimulates the vestibular system to induce sensations of motion. So as you can imagine, uh, the system, this paper was actually tested in VR condition with like Russian mountains, but could be used for autonomous driving, in any situations of motion sickness. So it's electrical stimulation. Uh, and also right now, Abi, he's a master student in the group. He's testing it in the projects with NASA in zero gravity um, because MIT has a lot of uh, open space initiatives. So they, for example, they want to bring this uh, to the um, International Space Station, actually. Uh, this, is, this is just three. And I'm obviously going to talk about some of my projects in actual talk. but. We are interfacing with sleep, for example, Masca. Uh, it's um, a sleep mask that can detect the REM states. Another project, it's EDA, it's called Dormia, uh, detects REM as well and wakes person up and primes the person to talk about something he or she wants to dream about. Uh, there is a uh, fast share that uh, could be, uh, it's an open modular system that can be sticked in any VR or AR headset to collect EEG, EOG, so brain activity, eye movements, uh, skin conductance, um, and there are much more. So actually, if you do uh, want to talk about those, we can definitely also uh, talk about those a bit later. So it's a very, very short of a brief. So while I'm switching to presentations, if you have some urgent question, please don't hesitate. Sorry, what? It's AC. No, it's only, um, so I tried it out. It's actually just here on the one point on the right and on one point on the left. So it's kind of next to the ear. So two points. And for the zero gravity project, I haven't actually tried it, but I have seen, I think I even have the images. It goes, so two points next to the ears, and the third one goes here in between the eyes. So it's basically like three point mini head cap, this kind of thing, so three points only. So uh, now up to brain computer interfaces. I call this cognitive augmentation one zero, and I'm gonna explain why is uh, this name. Uh, so as Christian mentioned already, I did my master in Grenoble in France and artificial intelligence. And then actually I'm doing BCI since 2010 when they were absolutely not popular. No one was actually doing them uh, that much, especially not HCI people. Uh, I did my PhD, uh, I got my PhD in 2015. Then I moved to another city in France called Rennes to do some AR, VR with BCIs. And since 2017, I'm at Media Lab and I'm continuing doing brain computer interfaces. So, why actually brain computer interfaces? Why should we even care? Uh, Harrison started with Big Bang. And obviously, as evolution continued, uh, we appeared, and as I already mentioned, we started creating a lot of tools. And these tools are making our life easier, simpler. But the problem is that uh, they're not perfect. We actually, uh, with each single tool we are having here, the cognitive uh, demand is increasing. But actually, it's very limited. Our cognitive resources are not getting any better, and they're not going to get any better. But BCI might be a solution. And I'm going to, in this talk, on top of giving you state of the art, showing you what should be done, what should not be done in BCI, argue about this point as well. So when some people hear about BCIs, they usually, and most of people, think about this. I am pretty sure any of you at least seen maybe one of those, Altered Carbon, Matrix, you name it. And they all look very interesting. They look like implants, points in the neck, something else. Well, unfortunately, reality, unfortunately, is still very basic. You need to have it on your head right now or inside of your head. We don't have any other options right now. There is like one version, it could be even embedded in your bed. 
So uh, I'm not going to cover in this presentation a lot of details on signal processing, but we can definitely talk in offline. But for those who might be beginners, uh, BCI usually works as following. We will uh, put a headset on, in the case of the non-invasive systems on the head of a person. We will do the acquisition explicit or implicit. It means that we will ask a person to do something for us, or maybe we will not ask a person to do anything. We will need to go through signal processing. I will explain why it's an obligatory step. We will need to do some classification, and then obviously we can do something interesting with the signals, maybe to assign them to some interesting applications that are of the paramount importance for the user. So what do we usually use for uh, brain-computer interfaces? Uh, we usually use several different modalities. Uh, visual modalities, visual techniques. For example, non-invasive EEG caps. Um, they are very popular, but it's a nightmare. A lot of people say, oh, when you get 128 Alex Trot setup, as you can see here on my head, you will get the best signal possible. They are good for selfies like this, and I would say <laughs> that's kind of it. Why? Because on the right, that's what you need to do to put this headset on me. You need to literally put it in water, fully in the solid solution, and then put obviously some cover on me, and then to ask me to wear it. On top of this, this huge white wire, it is actual wired part of the headset. It's connected, it's wired literally to the machine, and you're actually not getting better signal, because imagine, you have 128 electrodes, dimensionality reduction issues and all other problems, and just the fact of installing it that will take at least 40 minutes does not worth it in 99% of cases. You will go and opt for the solution in one single case. If you are looking for something, for a phenomenon in the brain that you don't know yet, where it is situated, why would you go for this? Because what usually happens, even if you have 128 electrodes or 256, you will still end up analyzing some local sources. So I would say go for this one only if you really want to investigate a neural phenomenon that you don't know yet where it is exactly. Or you try to re-implement something from MEG or from fMRI, I'm going to mention those, uh, and you really don't know exactly where to put your electrodes. That might be a version. Also, everything that is for source localization, that would be also a uh, go-to solution. Don't go and don't touch your user. It will not worth it. You will not obtain a better signal or a better classification output. No way. They, uh, you will gain 5 7%, which is not significant. What if you shave? You have to shave? No, that's even worse. <laughs> so a lot of people think, oh, if you are bald, it's going to work. What happens is that when you are bald, your skin actually go grows thicker, so it's actually much worse. The baldness is worse than hair. The worst that can be, it's like this kind of dreads, like traces, like that's, you will need topped for completely different types of electrodes. I'm gonna talk about this. So what you have right now, it's actually a huge amount of different EEG headsets and headbands, and they are much better. You will lose sometimes in quality, but they might be an option to go depending on your application, and I'm going to talk about this. Another version, uh, and this is, I would say, the one that is winning right now in the demoing stuff of applications that you can do with BCIs, and I'm going to, if you have time, I'm going to show you actual videos. This is fMRI. As you can see here, well, it was taken when I was still in France, so it's in French, but I guess you can still guess what it means. With this system, <laughs> I needed to do, to make sure that I don't have any metal in my body, pregnancy test, just in case, to make sure, even if I'm sure, and then you need to obviously be ridiculously lying down for like two hours. It's very noisy set up. In this particular case, on my head, I also, also have an EEG compatible cap, which is not easy. And the references in this case, for those who know where e how EEG usually works, I actually on my uh, neck and on my back. So on top of all of this, it's actually very uncomfortable to lay down. You should not be claustrophobic, you should be pretty healthy. This should be only particular sizes in the sense that fMRI 
and even the cap if you want to do two modalities. Why it is good? Why still people still go for this one? Obviously, you, you either you have one in the lab, it means that you run really serious brain research, or you really want to do some uh, hardcore visual decoding. I'm going to show some videos if you do have time. It's amazing what you can do with it. Uh, temporal and spatial resolution, it's another story. And finally, that's not the final one. There are more, but this is one that I consider interesting example. This is Meg. So the idea here is that on the left here, you can see the scanners that is based, most of them are based on squid sensors. On the right, these are optical sensors. So why it is so interesting? Because you st like, I showed it to some of my interns to say, it looks even creepier. It's not about creepiness here. It's about the fact that this version is portable. It's considered to be portable. This is a nice example how technology moves forward. There's a lot of startups, particularly in Silicon Valley, uh, Open Water, and some others that do claim that they're developing something that will break fMRI in cost by six to 100 times and in quality of the signal. But this is where we are right now. So there where the most improvement is made is still in these versions where you're trying to go into mobile version or we are still into EEG. Uh, I want to finish this very quick overview of technologies with this image because I think it's very interesting here. So you can see temporal and spatial resolution uh, up to actual local brain imaging. And what is interesting here maybe. Uh, you can read it out. It's like a raspberry color over there. Ultra fast ultrasound imaging. I don't know if you know, it's pretty novel. The research in ultra fast ultrasound scanners is not novel at all. But I assisted uh, April 2018 to the talk of uh, one of the co authors of this technology. And it's possible right now to do it on the neonatals, so on the babies. And he's trying to do it this summer. He actually invited me to come over to do some EEG with it, to do it on their adult human. Uh, why it is interesting? Um, because, as you can see, especially and temporally, we approach dramatically the implanted EEGs. And this is non-invasive. Not going to go into details about this one. I can give you the reference. But this is something that you should consider. There are still things that are interesting, that are moving forward right now, that we are Six years ago, when I just came first time to the lab, it's in Paris, actually. Uh, I was like, well, yeah, it's interesting, but nothing really. Six years later, they're really about to do it on actual adults. And the number of frames per second is like 60 or 70. It's like amazing good resolution. But as you got it, um, I did all my 10 years of BCI right now in EG. And I still consider that it is still the place to be in near future, at least for BCIs. But you just need to have several things in mind where you try to design for uh, an end user. First of all, what do we use to measure? And this is very important. Usually what happens is that people will opt for 128, the most expensive, the best one. Or we only have $200 for a Muse headband. Nothing against Muse headband, but this is kind of extreme situations. You really need to understand what are you actually doing with your application? Here on the top left, it's hybrid electrodes released in September 2018 by GTEC. They're based in Austria. Why they're hybrid? Because they take both gel and dry at the same time. Here, and I work with them since uh, six months already, uh, it's on the hand, but actually, uh, I'm using them for EEG. It's graphene-based electrodes. You might have heard about those. The problem is that they're extremely sensitive to noise. They're, uh, but you can see why they're so good. I don't actually need to. I wanted to put one on me and actually show you how it looks. But you would not barely see it on me. It's 80% transparent. And you can do it fully transparent. And on top of this, this is an electrode. Imagine if you, if you have the whole PCB, so if the whole amplifier, the whole module is going to be in these lines. Uh, this is actually brought several with me. Uh, they're somewhere in my bag somewhere. These are hydrogel electrodes, also pretty novel, pretty recent. Uh, I know only for now one band that is uh, having them. Very good quality as well. Some things to keep in mind. 
And these are pretty classic ones, uh, gold-plated pins. And once again, I just put one image. I'm using natural 92.5% silver. Um, this is also going to improve the signal quality dramatically and drastically. So this is just a very quick overview that think what you're going to use. If your task is person who has an LS, you need to think, will the hair be cleaned each one hour 30? Because I was doing this for five years, it's very annoying. And when you cannot tell that it is very annoying that your hair is dried there with this cream, you're going to destroy even 100% accuracy. BCI currently cannot deliver you 100. They are happy to take 60 and 70%. But if they don't feel comfortable, they cannot tell you right away. They're not going to use or opt for your application or for your system for what in the wild, even if you pay them for, to do so. If you are trying to do something that is more band style, something that is about applications that will monitor cognitive states, and I'm going to show those, you don't actually need to opt out for anything of this quality. You might think about something of this type or hydrogel. Why actually should you care about what you are using? Here is just one example. I didn't include all of them, but you just to show you that there is comfort, there is a signal gain, and there is a shelf line. So um, it's different for different applications. They also have different price. Manufacturing of graphene and manufacturing of hydrogel is 300 times more uh, cheaper than AG, AGCL. So this is very important. On the other hand, for hydrogel, you need to moisture them at least 40 minutes before you use them. That's another thing. It doesn't sound very, okay, 40 minutes is okay, but if you forgot, you're basically not going to be able to execute application. You need to delay it for 40 minutes. Just an example of these little details, thinking without them beforehand, think is a person going to move? Because they will move in most of the cases. If it's not six months before in the LS or like some myopathies, they will move, they will create some noise, they will move the hair, someone will move the hair, and they don't know all these details, but you can think for them. Graphene tattoos can stay on touch for 24 hours and up to five days with the deterioration of the signal only by 19%. You don't maybe need someone to wait for five days for other reasons, but what if you would like to monitor something 24-7? That could be another option. So what do we actually measure? A lot of things, really a lot. I'm not going to go through, once again, all of those, but I'm going to show one the most promising one, the most, uh, I would say, discussed ones, and then how the, we can actually work towards uh, applications and why the actually user opt for those. So one, uh, I would say, number one cited because they are kind of the easiest from the signal processing perspective, are earpiece. So um, earpiece look usually, let's say, right now I have a coffee with milk. If I'm going to tell you I want a coffee with a cat, 400 milliseconds later, approximately, in your brain there, was, there will be a peak of activity that will appear because the phrase that I just constructed semantically is incorrect. If I'm going to tell you, oh, I'm right now in Google, and then I just realized, no, I was at Google yesterday, right now I'm at Microsoft. Uh, I just realized that I have made a mistake, and before I even corrected myself, there is another peak of activity that will appear. The fact of me realizing that I just pronounced something that is not correct, error-related potential. So there are quite a few of those. Usually the name stands for NOP, it means when it will occur, is it positive or negative? And then the timing, so the name is usually 2 or 200, 4 400, it's approximate timing. So there are quite a few of those. Uh, we published last year, for example, at NBC a paper about pseudo words versus natural words. And this is one more thing. When you pronounce a word and a person doesn't know uh, what the word is, you can pick this activity up and using uh, N400 on FP1 uh, electrode, for example. Why it is interesting? Because right now, for these earpiece, you don't sometimes need to do any training for the user. You already have databases that are good enough to be initialized, pre-initialized at least, 
and then you can either do a calibration instead of training or you can give like several trials to the system and that will be enough to have a reasonable classification accuracy. So there are a lot of research right now and I particularly work on motor earpiece. You can see several papers that I think at CES this year they even presented. I don't remember what car was it. It was Honda or someone else who was actually trying to show this off. Earpiece that can be seen before you do the actual movement. So before you turn left or right, we can say I'm going to turn left or right between 40 to 400 milliseconds before you will actually perform the movement. This was proven with fMRI with the pass planning seven minutes before we can trace with 90% accuracy what pass you're going to take. If I will ask you, Christian, can you tell me how you go from your, work, from your home to your work? Hopefully each day it's kind of the same way you do it. So we can trace this in fMRI and then we can use the model to actually predict seven minutes before how you're going to actually execute it. For example, if there is, I can know, some cleaning machines that are going to be there, you, you'll usually turn that little street left because you know that usually they do clean this road because you do this for years and years. Another very interesting, and this, the next four slides, it has a small logo of uh, Albany uh, Neuroscience Institute. So I actually borrowed them when I was giving a talk there. Uh, because they are speci specializing in P300. Why it's interesting? Because it is one of the most famous accessibility tools in BCI. So they just recently, I'm not going to go into the idea of P300, it's very similar to what I just described. In the case of ERPs, you will provide target and non-target, and to help a user, you will flash the target. And they usually need to focus on target and ignore the non-target activity. So why it's interesting, this particular one, because in July 2018, they, f they finished four or five years study of this system in the wild with ALS patients. There was in total 118 people who opted for the study. Unfortunately, 48 died within two years. That's one again, ALS. This, all, this, all these issues, it's an extremely interesting paper. I talked to them, it's extremely interesting. The whole lab specializes in this right now, so it's pretty powerful. Why I actually put this, like, someone asked me, oh, why do you put this on the slide? I think it's very interesting because it's a person who typed the whole email using the system, using P300. So, um, the slides are not mine, but I think it's very interesting here to see how people actually use it. For example, the Sorry for the color, it's in black. I'm going to go like this in white so you can actually follow. For example, it's actually simple phrases. For example, to say for the caregiver, don't let the dog pee. Don't uh, speak louder. When a husband massaging her eyes, she asks not to rub them. So it's simple phrases, but they make a huge difference to the user. So the paper does state they, interest, they talk interestingly, like trying to address all the issues, how patients and therapists talk about BCIs, and they try in the third column to say that actually we have solutions for all of those problems. Comfortable, not practical, practi practical, not comfortable, how to use it without a specialist. Uh, so yeah, it's actually very interesting. Uh, the caregiver was trained once in three, six months, a person was coming over for checkup. If something is lost in connection, you will still be able to see this online. Everything is actually reported online. It's a huge, huge work. The amount of users might not be particular impressive, especially for us used to massive amounts of data. But this is all ALS people from the Association of Veterans of the US and uh, obviously could be uh, gone much further in the conditions that's what they're trying to get. I'm going to let you check the paper and I can give you the actual reference. Another one is called Steady State Evolved Potentials. This is, um, here I keep V that stands for visual. Uh, so once again, just before I play the video, because I will not play it in case it's a problem, does anyone have any epilepsy, any risks for epilepsy in the room? If not, I'm going to play the video very, f it's okay for everyone? Okay. That's exactly, Immediately I have shown you the problem of this system. You need to ask this before you're going to play this video. So here what happens, you actually see the, I recorded one of my experiments some time ago. So here you can see what, ha what actually happens. Uh, two stimulus flickering on different frequencies. You can play with the size. So what I was trying to do here is like to, to see how can we reduce the size. Can we keep it to a small dot somewhere? 
uh, on the screen to pick up and here like you can see some classification accuracy over there in real time. So this is, for example, not train system at all. So you have two classes, so binary problem, and to decide where a person is looking, on the magenta or on the yellow one. So the idea here is that um, user uh, will look at something that is flickering, particular frequency, it could be on the screen, it could be a physical object, uh, and we can pick up this activity. Uh, there are some rules. Uh, you cannot just put it in each single screen. Uh, for example, here you can see that's using the first version of Hollands uh, and uh, using the same paradigm. So there are some rules uh, to be executed. For example, you can see you can only take multiples of the flashing rate of the screen that you are using. Uh, the f further you go, the more visible it becomes. So you really need to think about the refreshing rate of the screen, et cetera. But in the very end, right away with no training at all, it can give you 75%. Doesn't sound a lot. Uh, it's a lot for classic BCI. Another example, which is much less relevant, but um, it is an interesting example. This system was used uh, to control, particularly in this example, uh, tail of the rat. So a person was looking at uh, the flashing frequency and the tail uh, of, the f of the rat over there was moving. So when a person looked on the left, the tail was moving on the left. When a person was looking at the right, the tail was looking at the right. Why well, I put it here is because actually I found at least 20 different papers who do this kind of application, controlling someone else's part of the body. There's also papers with cockroaches. I didn't put them here. <laughs> Red still looks a bit better. Uh, ERD, or motor imagery. So I guess you might know that when you um, do perform a movement, there is obviously some activity, some activations, the pre uh, premotor and motor cortexes. And this is extremely very well studied. So it's called desynchronization. And um, I would say motor imagery is one of the modalities is the studied the best, especially in particular in the imagination class of BCIs. Here is something I have done. We don't need this music, but it's okay. Some years ago, I think four years ago or something. So here a person is imagining two hands to take off the drone, imagining left hand movement to turn the drone left, imagining right hand movement to turn the drone right, and then both uh, feet to land it. And as you can see, here on the video. So it's in real time, it's pretty slow. And a person is not moving, uh, and a person is wearing an EEG headset. And here, well, you cannot see it very well, but um, the electrodes are only positioned on the motor cortex. So this is just one more example of showing that when you know where you look for a signal, you don't need to go with 128 electrodes or 64 electrodes or even 32 electrodes. You might be very precise if you know where you go. This is another example of the system. This is where motor imagery BCI was used to produce binary words and which was then transmitted to a receiver in the form of the prosphenes via TMS. So it looked like this, one person is looking and imagining a movement and another person is decoded in uh, words or in letters, and another person will actually see them. Uh, it's just a totally different uh, example, just to show how applications could be twisted, because people think, oh, motor imagery is only for movements. You can actually use it just as a control signal for whatever you want. It could be just like a brain switch. You think about this, and this will happen. Let's say it's like a shortcut. Obviously, motor imagery is actually very well studied. If you really want to try it out, tons of papers already there, but it's pretty limited. A lot of participants uh, are considered to be actually BCI literate. They don't even know how to train themselves to use it. We don't know how to train them. What is the problem? Maybe because we don't have a lot of options as well. And particularly, uh, there are a lot of other cortexes there that also can use imagery, and we might be interested in decoding those. So this was an inspiration for uh, um, other of my works, but it actually initially was published in fMRI uh, domain, mostly. So it is imagination of objects. Uh, particularly this one, it's Nature Scientific Reports in last year, I think. 
uh, we were interested in seeing if you can detect when a person is looking at one of those objects versus when he or she is imagining them. This is pretty simple because, as you can see, the objects are having very different visual properties, but still, can we actually pick this up? And here's just an example of one of the users. So it's a spectroclavated common special pattern map. So we're going to go into depth here. But uh, on the top row, you can see uh, the activation for the uh, hammer and uh, on the uh, lower one for the daisy. And literally yesterday in the Neuron uh, Journal, there was a release of a new paper from MIT about the specification of the TI part uh, intratemporal cortex within visual cortex that actually corresponds to uh, your possibility or your ability to imagine objects and to detect them and to classify them. What they did first was with the rats. Uh, they were um, uh, using some kind of drug, I don't remember the exact name, Nisalen, I think, uh, which would uh, block the firing of the neurons. And when that happened, uh, neither the mice nor the uh, monkeys were not able to recognize the objects they were trained to recognize. So it's like a very interesting paper, and I um, really suggest you to check out if you're interested in this one. So, so the, time, the electrodes here are on the visual cortex, yes. not in the motor. No, here, yeah, here it's only on the visual cortex. So uh, once again, it's just here, and there are 16 electrodes as well. Here is another example. Well, it's, it's also from one, so this was like a uh, more um, uh, stand video for uh, It's actually did this experiment, I think, when the film about Stephen Hawking was out. So I, I was very inspired by the film. So we did this study. Uh, I think it's Frontiers. Uh, what happens here is that a person, so it's a fully controlled smart house. Uh, it's obviously not in the wild study. But a person here imagines a door, a microwave, a TV uh, and a tea kettle. Five objects in total. Uh, it's only on and off objects, so open, close, on, on, off. But uh, we obtain 78% of specification accuracy. It does require training. The electrodes here are on the visual cortex. Uh, but it's another application where if you want to control an object, you don't want to go into imagination of a movement. You just want here it is, your gaze is already uh, working on it. You want to pick it up, but you maybe want to turn it on, to turn it off, etc. So it's another example of applications that should be towards the user. And we compared versus motor imagery, and the classification uh, output was 16% lower for the motor imagery, for the same types of uh, comments. Yes? So it's, this system will require 25 to 45 minutes of training. But all the participants that were um, disabled, they actually did performed at least one DCI study in the past, not with us though, but they already knew about the headset, they kept it, they need to use it, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. So this one, or this study was within one day only. So they were training one day, and then we had a, obviously a break, they always need a break, and then we were doing the, the experiment. Yeah. And how do you differentiate between looking at an object and imagining an object? I'm gonna come, I have the slides for this. So it's it's completely different activity in uh, alpha. And I'm gonna, I have a couple of slides, but actually I'll describe in the paper, but I will show this off. So actually, uh, this initial work, that I have done was inspired by the work from MSR that was done almost, no, oh, it's actually 10 years ago now. And this is a very nice one because it's the same idea, basically. It doesn't use any visualization and imagination. It's really observation. So looking at the objects and trying to identify them and to classify them. Uh, and um, you can imagine a, a lot of different applications, particularly particularly one that is not very well studied yet, but there are already some papers of collaborative DCIs. There is a huge amount of papers, particularly this one by Wong several years ago, where they actually proposed, I think, the first collaborative framework that at least I have seen, where the ensemble classifier was used to have the outputs of the single DCI user and then of a group of 20, and the classification output of a group improved by 25%. So from 60% for the detection task, they moved to 99%. And this is very powerful. If you can improve the classification by this rate, 
by having a group of users performing the task and not by having one user performing several sessions. This is a really interesting thing. I'm really surprised actually that people don't do more of this work, but it's really very interesting one. The common denominator of all these interesting things is that it all requires training, more or less. And obviously, with the fact of the training of the user, you do need to pay a price, not only of the fact that it is not a perfect classification, but also of the fact that it could be tiring, tedious, and even if the end user, like in the case of ALS, will see the benefit, they will opt out and they will not come to the session two and three. And I have seen those a lot. And it will be no matter if you're going to pay them, call them, stand in front of their house under the rain, that will be, <laughs> yes, I did this during my PhD, like all of it, that will be the same. So, but you can actually alleviate this and you can actually design something that will help you. Here's an example. You might know the word prime and it's a psychological phenomenon. When you will present a user with something like a stimulus, a prime, to modify his or her response to a latest stimulus. This is a probe. And we have a lot of those uh, semantic, visual, subliminal. For example, I'm going to tell, oh, Christian, you look amazingly good today. <laughs> yeah, you had like, I don't know, 10 hours of sleep. And I'm going to like praise you for like 10 minutes. I'm going to tell you how awesome you are. I love all your 3,000 papers from Kai. I follow all of them. And then, all of a sudden, 10 minutes later, I'll ask you, oh, Christian, can you just Drop me off or buy my hotel, please. And the probability that you will say yes, even if you cannot, it will be around 99%. Because I just used something that is called semantic priming. I was praising you positively. Usually we use this in our social interactions as negative. We say someone, oh, you're not capable or something like that. Used a lot in schools. We currently work with some classrooms, unfortunately, use a lot. Oh, Johnny, it's okay, you're not good in math. This is the strongest and the worst thing you can actually tell to the kid. We're going to talk about this a bit later and how BC can also leverage this. But priming is extremely, extremely helpful. Why? Because particularly example of visual priming, when you see something, it works usually in the cinema, but it could be in the publicity, anywhere. Um, you will see something, then you will crumble a bottle of Coke, you will get thirsty, and you will end up getting this bottle of Coke. Of course, I'm sim oversimplifying here. There should be particular timing when you present it. But this is how it works in general terms. Why it's interesting? Because imagine if you can do priming using BCI. So let's say I'm not going to tell my user anything about the system. Not at all. I'm going to just say, hey, I want to do some brain activity recordings. Can you come over to the lab? And I got 24 users like this, and they are all gamers. And I said, do you know Doom 3? It's the first person shooter game. And they're gamers. I think. I, I'm, it was my first game, Doom, it was Doom. I guess you all know what it is. For those who don't, tell me who don't know what Doom is. Okay, there are no people like this. That's amazing. It's exactly what I'm talking about. It's a dark game, and for any level, even if you have never seen Doom 2, 3, 4, etc., you need for the initial level two things. A flashlight, because it's very dark, and you need kind of a weapon, at least something, at least to survive the first level. Um, so I'm putting the headset on the users, and I'm going to tell them, hey, just play the game. I'm going to record how arousal, what is happening in your brain when you see this or that scene. But I'm not actually telling them anything about the game itself. And they start moving, and all of a sudden they find themselves in the dark corridor where it's very dark. And I will give them a flashlight. They don't have any activation uh, button to get it. I'm just going to give it, it to them. And I'm going to record, obviously, their brain signals during this moment. And exactly one minute later, they will find themselves again in their dark corridor. They can still continue the interaction. I'm not breaking their user experience. It's just pretty dark, but they can still move forward. But what will you think about if just one minute ago it was the same corridor, you got the flashlight, what will you think about? Flashlight, how do I get it? Like, what to do? If you do this, if the signal match, I'm going to give you a flashlight. The system is trained. You didn't do anything. I didn't drop a word of how to do it. And you got it. Since second trial, 100% of users understood what they need to do without explicitly me telling them what they need to do. And these were users who were novice in BCI. They knew nothing about motor imagery, visual imagery, any imagery whatsoever. 
Uh, here is the video, but I'm not gonna go through this. As you can see, it's pretty. It's like this. Yeah, but the game is a source code of the first level. So obviously, we it was a Tokai paper. We obviously compared with explicit setup and actually with implicit training within the game when I actually developed explicitly one level of the game. But this immersion, flow, and BCI performance were significantly better with this one. But I have shown you quite a few applications, like communication, typing, human-aided computing. But from now on, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on two, on health-related applications and on cognitive state monitoring ones. Why? I guess I already made my case about why, but it's where we are right now. Our devices, um, I liked um, this interesting uh, mention from the paper of 1957 by Clive, who seven years later suggested the first term cyborg, um, that robots will be our mechanical slaves. Well, I would say right now, and I would argue, it's an opposite. And we pay the price. And the price of suicide rates all over the world, schizophrenia, mental illnesses, ADD, ADHD, anxiety are only growing exponentially all around the countries, not only uh, in the ones that we consider to be those who are having issues. So the idea would be... What, this, the, what uh, sequences were extracted? Uh, sorry? The what sequences were extracted from papers? Yes, this was for papers about frontiers in 2015 or in 2016. The amount of uh, how many mentions of ample mental health uh, was, a, yeah, was happening like in the frontiers in human neuroscience. So can we give the control to the user finally so he or she can still look and live with the mechanical slaves around but actually be using them as a continuous part because this is so I don't have any single implant in my body. I consider that I am a cyborg, and we are all actually cybers to some extent. This is an extension of me, and I'm not going to drop it for any current reason right now. I'm going to drop some applications, but I'm not going to drop the device. And they will only go like just closer, definitely. But can it be more seamless? Can it be better? Can it be more productive? Can I get most of it? Right now, I would argue a lot of papers claim we are using 3% of the brain. That's a very, very questionable citation. I would argue that we are using 3% of this. And 97 are still awaiting. We just cannot leverage it. What can we do? And an idea would be, can you maybe somehow measure, let's say, attention or the cognitive load of the person and maybe in, in real time without adding additional burden and then provide some kind of feedback to him or her, telling, hey, you're not on the task on head, come back. But not using applications. They don't check them. They don't care about them. Or they don't load them. It's fancy for two weeks. And that's it. We actually did a study about those. So just to make sure that we are on the same page about attention, it's a holy war out there in psychology literature. When you talk about attention, it's very important to immediately in any of your presentations mention what it is because you can get into trouble very fast. So I'm using the, um, um, this uh, definition by Ola Jensen, is a very famous researcher, works a lot on attention, uh, recently on BCIs as well. So um, we can definitely measure attention in different ways. We can use heart rate, we can use galvanic skin response, but we can also use EEG. And EEG has proven to be the most reliable of all of them. We can talk actually about heart rate if you want, like why they are not the most reliable, and EDA. So how can we measure this? And this is kind of going to go into line of the, your question, how can we decide if a person is observing something versus when he or she is imagining something? So we can measure it in the same way I was talking previously by looking at the alpha activity, so spontaneously, so just having something on the head of the user, headset, a headband, or by evoking it, uh, as I already presented with some kind of different stimulus. So why alpha activity? Why not something else? There are several bands, as you might know, beta, theta, gamma, but alpha is known to be, once again, it's just kind of as motor imagery in uh, paradigms of BCI. Very well studied and actually is known to be inhibited in the task irrelevant regions. Let's say, if I need right now to present uh, to you uh, my talk, I'm going to definitely try not to listen to some kind of music if it will try to pay. It will be hard, but I will do my best. 
So there are different types of attention, really a lot of them. It's important always to explain and to know what you are measuring. Could be special, temporal, selective, and the most important for us, internal and external. So this is another terminology trick that people need to know when they do BCIs and they want to measure cognitive state. It's vocabulary. It's pretty, pretty unreliable out there. You might think no one did this, but actually when you start Googling it, that's exactly the term. So by internal attention, what is hidden, it's actually imagination processes. So internal, image, internal attention is everything that is imagination. Mental imagery includes visual, motor, tactile, auditory, etc. External attention is everything that is observation. It means that you are looking in it, but you are not really engaging with it. So we did our, a paper, and this is still under review for Nature and Neuroscience this time. The setup is pretty simple. You have a um, stimulus that lasts, uh, so first you have a cue. Uh, then you will have, uh, initially you will have some kind of stimulus, the video, seven seconds. And it has three modalities, haptic, auditory, and visual. And then you will have a cue. It will be a word, one of those modalities. And then you will have a break where you would need to imagine them. And you don't know beforehand which one you need to attend to. So you look at the video, you attend to all of them because you don't know which one will be the one that will be asked. And then we will ask you to imagine one of those. So the idea here, I can show you in a quick video. Mm. So person is wearing haptic gloves. They're custom made, as you can see a lot of cables out there wearing a 32 uh, EEG headset, and he just had a piano sequence. So the sound is artificial, it's a novel, and each finger is stimulated by a motor. And then he, he was asked to imagine one of the modalities, either haptic or visual or tactile. Um, so yeah, there's like a lot of studies, uh, a lot of different setups, a lot of uh, trials. So why to do this? Why, for example, we didn't use something like jingle bells or something that is ecologically much more valid? Because if you would use jingle bells, you would not understand what's happening for one single reason. Let's say I'm going to tell you, jingle bells, can you sing in your head jingle bells right now? Oh, I'm pretty sure all of you can. The problem is that because it is working memory, because it is long-term memory. Because on when you were last time singing Jingle Bells, it was with all your kids, and the year before, one of your kids couldn't make it from MIT on time to Seattle, so one was missing, so you, was actu you were actually sad. You have a lot of different activations when you are trying to revoke something that you already learned and you know. Let's say I'm gonna tell you blood, the same history. Oh, we all agree how it looks like, definitely. When I'm gonna ask you to imagine it, we will have like what 35 different representations right now and i'm not sure that we will be able to build something like reliable as a classifier on 35 trials it will be very hard because for each of you you're going to add layers and layers of something because most of users just don't know how they need to imagine something they just it's, it's just hard it's good for people who do it for years they know it's precise it's very sensitive it's very noisy it's very hard to give instructions. It's very easy to give instructions. It's very hard to make sure that people understand them because we cannot get into their head. So it's very, very good in these setups when we want to once again maybe test for something. Like the question is not directly application wise. It's just can we understand when a person is looking at something and imagining it while we are having all the modalities. So kind of as it is in real life. In YouTube you have three modalities. You usually don't have one. Uh, and the setup, and here is just an example. I'm gonna, I can share a part of the paper if you want. It's not published yet, uh, but I'm actually sh giving you the example of the one that is published, but it's actually the same result for both of them. In the first of, uh, so um, it is event related spectral perturbation. So it's kind of like, how can I explain it? So it's kind of like ERD, but much more generalizable because you can see all of the bands and everything that is happening at once. You don't need to check band per band. And what happens here is that in the left column in blue, this is observation. This is what happened when a person is just attending to the video. And on the right, that's what happens when the person is imagining any of modalities. And in the third, it's a significance. 
And I can tell you, if you cannot just see how significant it is, it is 90%. So I can say with 90% accuracy, if a person is looking at something or thinking about it, like actively engaging, thinking, oh, maybe I need to have this fancy cup with me because it looks so nice. Um, Jensen particularly did also like 10 years ago a very famous paper, tried even to go further, and I see that right now papers try to replicate this, even locating the attention. So left, right, up, down, this is also done with EEG, and they tried to do this with SNERS. With SNERS, it provided um, worse results. Here's an example of activations. So, uh, and I'm going to finally show you a system which usually for some reason, uses all this um, setup that I just shown you, but uses a very small, com like comfortable form factor. And on top of this, is doing something that usually BCI is not doing. It's iterative product design. So the project is designed uh, last year uh, at Fluid Interfaces, and this is me wearing the first version. So it's called Attentive View. And it's a band, as you can see, and I also wear a scarf. Uh, and it's very simple, it's exactly as I explained. We will measure if you engage, disengage with the task on hand, and we will give you a haptic feedback if you are not. There are several reasons why it's haptic feedback when you get into. There is also reason in why it's uh, a collar and not, for example, a band. We tested with the brain. You have emotional attachment that is negative towards particularly this guy, and you actually start ignoring any kind of vibrations within one hour, 30 after being using them if you do have this device. So we can get into these like, details uh, later if you're interested. So there's a lot of reason why it was uh, this cuff thing. And it has so EG sensing component, feedback in this case is haptic, Obviously, we have some software, and we actually have an application. We had 24 bands, and we did a multiple session experiment with multiple users wearing the system at the same time. And we had uh, actual students from MIT coming over to a l actual lecture with the lecturer. They were the same. They were getting different types of feedback. Some people were getting actual feedback about their brain activity, how attentive they are. Some people were getting random, because maybe random works as well. So randomly, it tells you, hey, wake up. And some, of course, were getting no feedback. And um, so obviously, you need to calibrate for this. You don't need to train. As I said, this is not that sensitive. This is not such a complicated phenomena. But you need to do the calibration. In this case, we do cal calibrations that last five minutes. Tops, uh, it's actually kind of a priming as well. I, will, I was asking them to do some arithmetic tasks, some end back visual tasks. End back is when I show you an image. I'm going to show you the second one, and I'm going to show you the third one, and then I'll ask was it the same or not. Uh, and in this case, is the number of the image that is appearing. So for example, N1 will be very simple, N5 will be very hard. It will be maybe potentially impossible for you to actually recover it. Here's an example how it looks like, the calibration session. So this is. The same application we have for minors who have ADD, DHD. That's why you have some trees here. Ignore the trees, but you can still look at them. It's a nice animation. So just follow the number on top of there that is zero and listen to my voice. It is in real time. I'm asking um, a user to actually uh, do mental calculus. So there is no sheets of paper. He or she does not see any phrases, so it's a mental calculus purely. Just look at the value, how it changes, and listen to what I'm giving as instructions. So it's a scale of 0 to 100, 100 being extremely engaged, 0 being no, actually no connection, not engaged in the case of, we would say, dead person. <laughs> no signal. As you can see, I'm going to stop on this one. Once the numbers are just start sounding more complicated, 
like 300, 200, the tension goes immediately higher without even preceding what was the second number. Maybe I'm going to say 300 and 0, which is going to be very easy. Maybe I'm going to say 300 and 100 or 300 and 500, etc. So you can see there's um, really a difference. It's pretty sensitive, so the person stays engaged. A uh, person reported that mental calculus is not the easiest task for him or her. So it's very important also to know, because our assumptions of what is easy. Uh, for example, for me, it stays in the range of 19 and never goes up. And usually when I test on myself, I think, OK, not working, whatever. When I did uh, the first pilot with 17 users, oh, and then I just think, maybe I will ask them, is it actually OK for them to do this task? And then you're like, Oh, actually not. It's not as easy. Even if people have a like, PhD in computer science, it has nothing to do with it easy or hard task to them. You always need to make sure that they understand it, they're capable to perform it, and actually then you can set up the baseline correctly. It's very important. It's very important. Because if for a person this is an easy task, but you consider that having something like 300 and 400 is not easy, you really need to do it correctly. That's why individual training and calibration is paramount in most BCIs right now. So I mentioned that you can still do some databases in, in socialization in the case of like P300. In the case of these uh, kind of systems, you need to go for calibration. It's like you cannot not to do it. It cannot be generalizable at least in the beginning, like no way. Why it happens as well, it's also because right now as I had a coffee, which is a stimulator, my activity will be very different from when I don't have it. It depends how many hours I have slept. It depends if I'm sleep deprived. It depends if I have been driving for six hours or not, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not going to go into details of results or papers published, but in yellow you can see the biofeedback. In our green and red you can see the random and known feedback. And it was significantly better. And obviously we have clustered slides in different types, like OK, boring, interesting. It cannot be always interesting, it can be always boring, but for example, for the boring ones, we actually instructed the lecturer not to just explain at all. So it doesn't mean that it will be like formulas only, but just like don't explain them at all. So even if you're engaged in the lecture, you like it, you want to follow it, you admire your professor, he or she's amazing, you will just, if he or she's not explaining anything, you're just not going to follow. So we really wanted to test the system. So it's another example. Think about how you can test it if the conditions are realistic because we went for a realistic application. We actually done three different experiments with more than 100 unique subjects in this case. And we even tried this as a workplace with a programming task. We have, it's very hard actually to do kind of realistic setups, but we tried to do something where we can control uh, for the output of the user. So in this case, it was like someone like the, uh, from their superiors who can set if the task was actually executed or not. And this is the interaction I was talking about. This is usually you don't see this in BCIs, and this is really the direction to, to do and to go with. We had a system that was functioning. It used something that is state of the art. We didn't even try to, we have our own ideas for the algorithm, obviously, that we tested, but we really tried to replicate what was in the state of the art with the off-shelf device. It provided good promising results. People stop here. Most 99.9% .9 of BCI research in the labs stop there. They don't try to do something that could be released, make it available, or made better. In this case, better means this, again, not 100% classification accuracy system. But it is good enough to be tried out in maybe another form factor. This is an example of the form factor. It's glasses. In this case, the first prototype, we have a better version now. This is a paper accepted for IEEE BSN this year. It has, actually, I'm going to play you the video, and you will see. It has two modalities, so it's another example of how you can compensate for imperfection of BCI. You don't design for user who lives in, a, in Mars. He or she is still here, has all the other modalities, objects, devices, leverage them. In this particular case, the form factor was glasses. You can have two positions of the glasses that are not used. I would say they're really not used. On the temple here, no one is usually putting anything on the temple here and here. 
You have Bluetooth speakers, bone conduction, whatever you want to have here. You can have different lenses with different infrared cameras, etc., whatever. But you really have two points that are not used. Like, we reviewed like 20 of different pairs of glasses. They're not used. But you can put electrodes on the, them, and on top of this, you will have two modalities. You will have EEG and EOG, eye movements. And you can compensate for the imperfection of both of them, because there is not a single physiological modality that is perfect. You name it, I'm going to tell you when it's going to fail and why. And also, if you name a product that I might work with, for example, I'm going to even tell why it's going to fail. Whatever it is right now in the market, it is not providing you with 100% classification accuracy. But you can try to get one, potentially by combining it. Early fusion, late fusion, uh, I will let you watch the video before I go further. It's actually almost the end. Anyway. You're laughing, but I had three users who literally have fallen asleep. Like, you're laughing, but that happens. And yeah, don't forget, your user will try to always see that it's not work, not working, and he will always or she will always try to catch this. So it's actually good feedback. This was just to show that one improved design can cover not only imperfections by having another modality, but can cover several scenarios. It doesn't have anything else as information. And you can still have several options. For example, we just submitted the paper, but you can see that there is still another device that goes with it. Potentially, it's a haptic feedback. Why it is still there? We actually did the study, 36 users, 30 preferred auditory to haptic. Six who had ADD, ADHD preferred haptic strongly to auditory. You need to have options for the user. It might be a minority, but they will not use it at all if they consider that it was distracting. For them, auditory feedback was distracting. For all the rest of people, 
users, they reported that it was amazing, they liked it. So do a lot of iterations. It works, it's not gonna work 100%. We are trying to put it out 100%. We are doing like this, like Graphene. But right now, uh, the third version that I'm working in is actually fully Graphene based, for example. So it's another form factor. It's going to be like a tattoo. It's fully transparent. Uh, it cannot read visual imagination. But that's not what the aim is. We have a setup. We have a set of users who want the system, who want to try it out for hours. And if it's what it does, and if it's already validated, it does Whereas investing, it does worth a try. Don't forget that you have several categories. You cannot maybe cover all of them, but you can have different subversions that can cover a lot of them, depending on what you are aiming for. This is something that is usually not done in BCI. Like, I cannot name a single product right now that is actually doing something in this direction. Uh, I have one more just to actually show off once again in this way, and I'm gonna do this very fast. But actually, we can all also like finish because I see that exactly one hour. So yeah, it's just like just to show off like something else that can go in this direction. But it's actually good for now. Yeah. Can you take a question on this one first, or you want to move on? No, no, I think it's actually one hour, so I think we can move on. Yeah. 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 Oh, you are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I said that I think as it was one hour, we can move on. Yeah, I mean, we can move on with the questions. Exactly. Yeah, if there is, for example, you want to see some like other applications, definitely I can show you of some other systems. It's, it's again in the same vein of, it's completely different application. In that case, it uses actually multiple electrodes. So it's nothing of the form factor that is like flexible. It's actually completely opposite. But it's an example of how it can work also very well even if it, you will look like octopus after you put it on, people will be actually willing and making lines to try it out. Just because you make something on top of it. So yeah, but we can already take, if you like want a question that is like urgent, we can do that. Um, Just like one iteration of completely opposite system. Yeah, I was curious with this one, for internal distractions, yeah. if your mind is going somewhere, then it like notifies you. But then the last video that you showed, the mm -hmm. last segment, uh, it was an external distraction, yeah. phone buzzing. And there, it's you put on the glasses, and it silences the phone. Mm -hmm. Not that it buzzes at you, but it actually sends the phone and it turns off. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It sends off the notifications, so yes. And if someone's coming at you asking you a question, like you're sitting at your desk, yeah. and, and you don't have a way to just turn that thing off, that person over there, uh, is it going to buzz at you, or what, how's it going to Yeah, so what, ha well, what happened, actually, on my desk right now, at the lab, and I think Patty also actually wants it. I think everyone right now in the lab wants it. I have a lamp. It's a lamp, just with one like bulb. And it's red when I'm engaged into something. It means, do not try to approach me. I'm going to be like very angry crocodile if you will try to. It means I'm in the flow of the task. The thing is that this flow state, it's really very short. It will never exceed one hour, except if you are a trained sportsman, like Olympic sportsman. I have worked with this uh, category of users, like Formula One, etc. You, If you are not, and you're just in the workspace, it's never gonna exceed one hour, one hour, 15 tops. It will go on yellow, blue, eventually, or green, and people know, because that's the time to bother you. But in the case of like, if you're gonna be bothered, it will actually, because you are trying to internally uh, rehearse, for example, a presentation, and someone will come over, like your intern will come over and say, oh, could you please sign this document for me? And I'm like, I have these slides to rehearse, they, 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 and you, I don't have time. Oh, just one second. He or she doesn't understand the effect, but you can actually visually show them the effect with the lamp. Yeah, it will buzz because you basically broke it down, but then it will stop because actually there is obviously a point, I mean, we have tried different vibrations, different iterations, it's not gonna buzz non-stop, but we can definitely see that you're not engaged with the task on hand that you were doing. So there's a huge change between what you have been doing at literally time minus one as a time t. And if the change is big, and it's gonna be big if it's a switch between internal and external, that's what I showed you on with those like 32 electrodes, we're gonna buzz because it's not gradient as I have shown you with computations, with mental calculus. It was switching, it was, uh, but it never dropped for that particular user from 68 to one, never ever. That means that there's a huge switch and a huge change. And this is, if it was not classified as a movement, because in real time obviously we take out these ones, and because on top we have EOG that can actually provide us a lot of other information, we can definitely know for sure what is happening around you. Yeah. 
all individual are those scaling factor to convert the attention to to a scale from one to one hundred. Individual, very individual. So you really need to do. So you do for for each, each user, and even if, for example, for returning users, because there was over three weeks, I'm going to do, because they even assign their own headsets and their own like scarves and, and glasses, etc. I'm going to do it even if they take it off. I, for example, I suggest them take them off during lunch. You don't need to be attentive during lunch. You want to be a creative to t talk some nonsense with your colleagues, with your like loved ones. Take them off. You don't need them. You don't want to maybe be attentive at all times, but do the calibration once you get back. Because it's different, it's a completely different state. And it actually very, helps a lot when you show the images, for example, how your brain was at time one, and how your brain actually changes, the alpha activity in this case, changes at time t plus one. Because you usually don't know that, you don't understand that, oh, I didn't do anything, I just like, just checked very quickly my 3,000 identifications over there, but I was there. But when you show the cost of switching, in the points of how long will it take you to get back on your task in the same state of flow as you have been, that makes a huge difference for the user because then he's just like, oh, oh, wow, I didn't know that. I thought it's good to be interrupted. Not always, actually not at all. So a lot of things that you can leverage is showing our users what is to be done and what is not to be done. And usually we do not do that. But just showing them a couple of slides definitely helps in the end of the day when they're like, oh, well, that's what happened, that's what I did. But you do need to calibrate if you want really good results. I find that I have like a really lot of data. Generalization model is not working, especially with attention, especially with attention. So I understand that this is a very technical question, but you have two EEG electrodes here, right? Yeah. Where do you get the reference? Here. Okay. Yes. So those electrodes which are taking the movement of the eyes are also reference for the... Yes, so there are two references here. They're just close to each other so you don't see them in the design of the glasses. One for EOG, one for EEG. Then we calculate the difference. Obviously, you do need this. And then on the sides of the nose, you have EOG. As you know, maybe for EOG, usually most of the research is done around the eyes. For horizontal vertical movements, you don't need to do this. You just need to do, obviously, very heavy signal processing. But you can get, if you have three electrodes here, the beauty is that, I don't know if you know, from, actually, on this image, that's not um, our prototype. I should have uh, cited this one. It's Debener 20, no, it's Mirovic uh, 2016 Frontiers in Human Neuroscience. So this is around here. It's a full set around here. It's 10 electrodes. But actually, two electrodes that are exactly where my electrode goes for the temple on the here on the temple point are actually exactly referencing for horizontal and vertical eye movements as well. That's again, I didn't include any of the signal processing and all this kind of technical details because then we will never end up here and it will be not a talk but a three-day seminar. <laughs> but this is exactly these little details. Once you have one modality, can you leverage something? to get a better classification output for another modality? And the answer is usually yes. You can definitely, and we have tried to do this with ED, with heart rate, with some modalities it works better, with some modalities it works uh, worse, but that's the magic of it. Usually, with, especially with light fusion, you get a better signal. You mentioned how you process the EEG and the proportion of the energies in the three frequency bands. You didn't say anything about how you process the eye movement, the signals from those electrodes. So yeah, this is one, this is patented, so I cannot really tell you how okay. yeah, do it. But in um, the papers that are, um, in BS, no, in BSM paper, we don't say this. Hopefully, if the paper is accepted, we will provide its value transform and Kalman filter. So we will provide a version of how you can do this. Okay. It is, I can say right away, it's going to be worse but it is still comparable uh, accuracy to the one that is uh, you are getting when you place them around the eye. So yeah. Can I ask back to yeah. calibration again? Yeah. Have you found the need to recalibrate the same person after a week to, when you're trying to measure attention? Yeah. Yeah, I have calibrated, so I have several users who are coming back users, so from those who have ADD, ADHD, they found the system useful, so they actually contact me to get back on the task. Some of them I just have like 
my interns and some other people in the lab that I need to try it out urgently. Uh, and so, yeah, I actually know the values. And they actually know the system very well, which helps a lot. And the thing is that you always need to calibrate it. And uh, the values are usually, for example, I know that, let's say, for user one, whoever it is or he is, uh, I know that this is actual range. I just used to because I work with him a lot, I interviewed him a lot, I observed him a lot. And actually, it's not going to really ever change dramatically. But once it happened, he actually got into some issues with his supervisor. And he was very distracted. And actually, I saw this. I was like, OK, we didn't calibrate. OK, the electrode's like, well, some kind of, well, well, something is happening. I don't understand why. And then I'm like, hey, what's going on? Do you want to just like, talk or something? Is everything fine? I think, I mean, let's drop the study. I think it's not working. But then I saw, like, everything's good. Impedance check, everything like, seems OK. And then we just actually talked. Ah, and then, I, yeah, I found this out. So it's interesting that you can see the patterns Obviously, in, for this case, he would need to wear it for days or for weeks. But uh, actually, I had on myself and two other people use it for 14 days in a row. They're trying to have it like for an hour for one month in a row to see the difference. And that would be something interesting because then you will have potentially enough of data for one user at least for prediction. What is going on? Because we definitely see the difference when a person is having a deadline for the paper and when there is no deadline for the paper. The actual average range for the whole week is going to be higher, number of hours of sleep shorter, number of steps shorter, like we got this like in the paper. And I see, you know, you have these additional values. Your system buzzed one or two times uh, inaccurately. No one will actually pay attention in this case. Because you have actual predictions that is based not only on one modality, but in that case on three, four, or five. But yeah, you would need to calibrate for each of them, but you actually see interesting trends, and we try to see out on the longer period if actually we can confirm what we are observing. Yeah. So you talk at all about drift over time? Like for the different, I mean, I assume with different kinds of electrodes, you're going to have different kinds of drift. Yes. So, um, gel based. <sighs> you know the story. The gel is going to be really like stone in your hair in within one hour, 32 hours. You need to reapply it. I have heard recently that they're trying on the recent conference, they're trying to have some like interesting, like not washable, like so you can, you can dry shampoo style. So you just do this and you're all fine to go. The problem is that it really starts like to each, so a person starts move. And so this moves, the, it moves a bit to their headset, you are done with the signal. You really need to re reapply everything, do the impedance check again, especially if you have multiple electrodes, especially the case I had, I had caps. For the hydrogen, for I, for example, for the glasses, I do use um, silver. I found it's much better than stainless steel, but actually, like even little details, like say, the screws, the material for the screws, are you making them in brass? Are you making them something else? Will change the signal. It's so, so, so obvious, but not with BCI, for example. So silver, obviously, uh, only if you have makeup, obviously it will uh, not provide you a good signal. All the other cases, if the hair here is like, you, like my case, as it's like not covered or pretty short, it will be all good. And uh, obviously, I would say no drift except excessive, excessive heat. But in heat, I haven't seen yet a single physiological sensor that can survive heat, let's be very honest. Then the problem with hydrogel should be hydrated. Once you do it beforehand, it will last for one hour, then you need to reapply the moisture. Uh, Usually, it's actually they do it like with little like wipes, so it's actually very easy, and they're pretty comfy. The problem is that once it's mushed, it slides a bit, so this is immediate drift in your signal. You need to make sure that it is actually really staying in place. So I would say there is nothing perfect. I personally do believe a lot in graphene. I have tested it a lot. We haven't published yet. The problem is noise. You, it picks up single noise that is around here, like environmental noise, like uh, you name it, it's gonna be there. The problem is that, or like actually the amazingness of graphene is that this stays in put. 
EDA heat, not extreme heat maybe, but if you don't like literally take it out, it's gonna stay put, and there is no uh, drift, significant drift over five to eight hours of what I have been wearing. Then I, I needed to take showers, so it basically it went off. But it's, all, it's like disposable, so this is also good. They claim in their all the initial papers where they have tested that it can go up to five days. Haven't tested it, but I can say that I would believe it because especially I, but I work with Texas, University of Texas and with um, University of Montreal where they actually print them out and then I'm as interested in packages of those. So actually I do believe that it might be interesting because I didn't see any drift within five to eight hours with this one. Whatever is actually happening around. Once again, no makeup for women on those. Mm, heat, it was hot, it was summer, it was winter. Everything, obviously, once you rub it or like, I know, wash your face. Uh, the problem with those, obviously, it should be skin contact. You cannot put it somewhere in the head. This is the same. The, for the glasses, you were just using straight silver or silver silver chloride? Or it's straight silver, natural silver. So I tested with versus silver silver chloride uh, versus stainless steel versus like copper. Like, uh, we went through everything. And natural silver is the best. But it's the highest uh, conductivity, 92.5. It's natural silver. And when it's polished, it gives you three extra percent of conductivity. Funny, but once again, small detail that can change in your case when the contact might be less. So it's like, once again, just example of how you can really think about it and the design can improve it. You also do need, obviously, to do compliant design in this case because it's glasses. So obviously, this is an electrode. This is silver. We tried the, like, this is silver, like pure silver. When it's like silver coated, it does, you do lose in conductivity, you do lose in the quality of signal, but you do need to obviously equilibrate for the other electrodes that you have, because if then it will be too heavy, your user's not gonna wear it. So it's again, one of the details you need to think about. But with a good... No, no solution, solution? No, no solution. Dry oh yeah, they are just literal. I was actually thinking to bring them. The problem is that they have a little battery inside of them. And with the plane, I really didn't want to obviously get a case and I was actually wanted to bring them. It does, it's just normal glasses, yeah. And the, and the current version, this is the published in BSN, and the current version uh, is actually even slimmer. You cannot, I mean, we, we, we want to try to really get as slim as we can. Uh, it will depend on the size of the components, battery, capacity of the battery. So we're actually planning some trips to Korea and to China to investigate those because they can also do a lot for you. And this is something, something that BCI community is not looking at all, like at all. Uh, there are some companies that do produce uh, amplifiers, 30, 40K. Amplifier does not cost 30 or 40K. Let's be very honest. This PCB, oh, it has two electrodes. Okay, now, okay. in total, six electrodes, actually, to be very honest. Well, it's, it stays like two PCBs on two sides. That's enough. Once again, it's not going to be visual imagery. It's not going to be motor imagery. It's nothing fancy, fancy. But for one application, that might be enough. And Natalia, you designed the preamps, right? Sorry, what? You designed the, the preamplifiers for the... Yeah, I have designed them, yeah. Obviously, I have, uh, as I told Christian, I also had, uh, right now, I have... Um, a designer from Parsons, she helps a lot because now we need definitely like compliant design, calibrate, all the kind of things. You do need some professional help from this, but yeah, I designed for the single process and perspective and everything. And we are exactly looking how to make them more user friendly. For example, people don't like the straight line, etc. etc. So there's a lot of all these little things that community doesn't look at, but if you do want to have a product, you do need to look at them. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, raw signal that you have from this? Yeah, I can show you in offline if you want. I definitely have some papers here, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah! Uh, first of all, is this the end of the talk? Yes! Well, then, and, okay, uh, we should probably uh, thank you. Yeah, it's kind of... I lost their mic, so it's actually the end, yeah. So,